Chester. So you actually, before you moved into the acting stuff, you actually were a journalist, right? You you did some uh, work for Interview Magazine, and uh, I think that's way too respectful of terms. <laughs> yeah. What would you? I mean, the truth is, I was an editorial assistant. Yeah. You know, slogging away with very little money, and really mostly correcting other people's writing. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, but I like the sound of Germans better. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you gotta start so go with that. Well, I mean, I was one of the great fake news guys of all time. Fake <laughs> before it was fake news, yeah. 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 Well, I, actually, I mean, the reason I ask that is because then when you go on to do all these interviews and junkets and uh, sitting in front, of, uh, in front of interviewers, you get asked a lot of the same questions, you get, like, did you kind of, like, develop a sense of uh, who was going to be a good interviewer? I developed a sense of ennui. Ennui. Yeah. No, um, the truth is, I briefly worked uh, in the White House as an advance man for George Bush Sr. And um, part of that was dealing with the press. Yeah. And so that's actually where I learned more about than anything. Uh, what we did in interview and so forth, we, we interviewed celebrities. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of times it was a celebrity interviewing a celebrity. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have the same basic exposure. So, yeah, and then, you know, when I learned about the journalist thing, it was mostly uh, uh, being an advanced man for the president's an interesting thing. And you're probably asking, wow, we must be totally fucked with a guy like that. Trips. The answer is you're correct. <laughs> um, we basically would go before him yeah. and journalists, we had the schedule and journalists would just pound us. I mean, everywhere I would go, they'd corner me and say, where's going next? Where's going next? Where's going next? And, and then I realized how aggressive the press really was. Yeah. Um, but it was interesting. Yeah. Very interesting experience. Well, it's an interesting kind of like uh, skill set to pick up because then when you end up uh, being on the other side of the interviews, when people are asking you the questions, you kind of have to know, okay, this is what this is what this reporter is going for, this is what they need, this is how to massage the story. Like, you kind of manage those interviews. For the president? No, no. Like, when, Journalists, entertainment journalists, we're no, I mean, you're again giving them way too much credit. I, I can't think on those that many levels. Sorry. I just like hear a question, and most of the time I don't answer it seriously. That's how sophisticated I am as an interviewee. All right, all right. okay. Uh, well, okay, so let's open up the audience questions. Who has one? You guys didn't have any a minute ago. And okay, we're going to start over here. Hi. Stand up, say it loud. I guess we don't have microphones, so. Younger brother, you were a great inspiration to him, and he actually joined the army, and he wanted to be just like uh, Lieutenant. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel John Shepard. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I was just hoping, do you mind if you just give a shout out to? What's his? Absolutely. Corporal Hyatt. Corporal Hyatt. Okay, I, I say where's Corporal Hyatt? He's training in the States right now um, on a live firearm range. Okay, well, let's hope he's not looking at his phone while he's looking. <laughs> it's Isaac <awesome>. Cooper. <laughs> okay. I, I think he's responsible enough not to do that, but I, I can't be sure. That's, all right, well, let's, yeah, okay, so is your phone ready? Cor his name is Corporal. Corporal Hyatt. Corporal Hyatt. Yes. We'll all do it. <laughs> Giving a big shout out to Corporal Hyatt right now. We miss you. All right. He's gonna love that. Thank you. And this is where I get to be a buzzkill. So let's, let's avoid like any more special requests because it just takes up time and stuff. And we don't want to. We don't want to do that. But uh, let's go ahead and throw another question over on this side. Anyone? Okay. Well then, yeah. Hi. Who brought in the uh, uh, Johnny Cash theme here? I did. <laughs> I was a Johnny Cash fan. Yeah, so I thought to myself, okay, 
if you're going to space and you have to represent humanity, who do you bring? Yeah. <laughs> Makes sense to me. So, uh, yeah, I just made that thing. I also thought it would be cool, like, that I'd be in my puddle jumper. I hate that puddle jumper. It's, it's the, it is the equivalent of, like, the space minivan. It's so embarrassing to drive. I kind of feel like, okay, Taylor, get out. And I'll pick you up after school. And I thought, okay, we need to jack this up. I need to be listening to, like, Johnny Cash when I'm cruising around killing things. Um, and they like that idea, so we kind of kept it going. And then, of course, we have to call the Johnny Cash estate. You have to get all that stuff cleared. And I, it was very easy for me to get uh, clearance from people because they would be like, well, we're not sure how much money is it. And I'd be like, just shut up. You're going to be the first country western singer in space. <laughs> They're like, hey, that's pretty cool. Well, that was, uh, so he passed away in 2004. I think. No, it was the estate we were talking about. Right, yeah, so, but this happened sort of shortly after he had passed away. Yeah, probably, yeah. I mean, it's just kind of cool because it's like, yeah, you're bringing cash to space after he passes away. That's right. Um, and it kind of makes the, uh, the minivan slightly better. Slightly better. It slightly gives me a little more street cred with the race. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, this guy pulling up and I mean, oh, but he's playing cash. All right, yeah. It's Colonel Shepard. But he's showing up in a public number or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Yes, yes, with the hat, yeah. Would you want to do another series like Stargate Atlantis, a Lilo Festival with your career, and do other work with episode TV and movies? So let me repeat that. Just would, uh, would you like to do another Stargate series or, you know, do something else? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if it's the right one, for sure. I used to look at a show like, oh, what's this show? Where's it going? What time is it on? I don't really do that anymore. Now I just look at it in terms of a role. If I like the role, then I'll do it. Uh, so the answer is yes. And, you know, who knows? Maybe they'll reboot Stargate. Who knows? It's, yeah. It's really hard to know. I mean, I don't know what they're doing. They're sitting on... They're sitting on a franchise. It's just collecting dust. It's like, I, I, they just don't understand. They're, they don't understand. Yeah, and it, and it seems like they're putting energy into it uh, with Stargate Command and like, you know, reviving it slowly and there's Diamond Home, the interview show with Chris Judge that's online. No, um, I, I, I'm not gonna disagree. I don't think they're putting enough in. I don't think they, I still don't think they can. Mm. Yeah. Well, then, I, I think getting it is, what are we doing? We have millions, tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of fans around the world. Why don't we reboot the show? You know, that's yeah. right. Well, something that's sort of become like really a part of like your personal lore that it comes up a lot at, at cons is the fact that you actually did try to buy the rights to the series, and and it's a it's a story that I think is out there a lot. Um, but I guess my question for you is that as an actor, when a show goes away, or when it looks like a show's going away, you just move on to the next job. What was it about this job that was like, all right, you know what, I care enough to try to put my own money into it and keep this going? Well, for one, the, the, the studio was going bankrupt. So it wasn't like they were making the intelligent decision. They were going bankrupt. Yeah, and I was looking at the show, and, and you know, you're talking about a show that we syndicated in our first season, and that's kind of unheard of that you syndicate a show in the first season. You know, when you're a Stargate actor, you're running around, you're meeting fans, it's like, you know how big it is. And I just knew that there's just so much untapped potential in this show. It's the type of show that could go on forever and split off into various, you know, you know venues. Um, and so I just thought it would be a good idea. And it really, we, I came pretty close to getting it. Um, and then after MGM did go bankrupt and then reemerged, the guys from Spyglass, they, they weren't willing to sell it. Yeah. I, I wasn't going to buy it, I was going to lease it. So, anyways, it's unfortunate. They wanted to give it to Dean Devlin and Roland Emmerich to redo the film. Yeah. And I tried to tell them, well, you know, I know we're. Hollywood is a little like everybody wants to be at the cool party and the movies are cool. TV's kind of like, well, it's not as cool as the movies because movies have bigger parties. <laughs> Quite literally. And um, 
most of the time, TV actors were just working away in some other country. Um, and so they wanted to do a movie, and I said to them, you go look at the, go look at the stats between the, the Stargate movie yeah. and the Stargate TV show. <laughs> and tell me why you wanted to do a movie instead of the TV show. I mean, literally. Uh, we were, f I think in our third season, my show alone, and that's not a good Stargate, my show in the third season net profited $240 million. Mm -hmm. Well, that's just gigantic in, in the realm of things. That's a net profit. So uh, you can see you're wondering why they canceled it. Yeah. yeah. So there you go. Well, if you had that worked out, had you acquired those rights, what was your plans then? Were, were you going to continue starring? Would you have been... I would be king of the world. <laughs> I would out Trump Trump. I would yeah, Trump. Yeah. Who's being there? I put Stargate on every building. Holy! I put Stargate on every. I mean, like Joe's Stargate. <laughs> Joe's Stargate Cafe. Joe's Cafe. Yeah, had it all. Yeah, franchise. Yeah. Uh, I just got another question. Hi, right up front. Yeah, I noticed Jason Momoa is here, and so is Richard <coughs> Anderson. Do you otherwise keep in touch with those guys? Is Rick here? Is Rick? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> well, I guess you don't keep in touch. <laughs> Jason and I see each other all the time, we're like best buds. That, that's really nice. Yeah, yeah you have a picture. Right. Uh, and we also live very close to each other. And, cool. we're, and we actually go to most of these together. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, Rick, I haven't seen him in a long time. Ironically, live, Rick lives right down the road from me, and I still haven't seen him. <laughs> well, I'm like, there's Joe. <laughs> hey, Rick, it's Joe. What's up? No, he, 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 I just don't see him that much. So in his, we live in Malibu, Malibu's a really small town, everybody kind of knows each other, and especially if you have kids, they go to school. His kid went to school over the hill and was a little older than, I think, my kid. Otherwise, we would have spent a little more time together, so. Yeah, yeah, I see you almost for king of the world, but now just Momoa's Aquaman is king of the <laughs> No, I think at night, I probably, I'm not aware, I'm probably saying things when I say, like, motherfucker has four action figures. <laughs> he does get, like, four action figures. I'm like, what? That's not fair. And, and a trident. A trident that's, been, that's got more than three. It's a quadrant or whatever. Crazy. <laughs> but I love it. I mean, literally, so happy for him. He, he's like my brother. I mean, you know. I just love seeing that type of success for him. I thought it would happen sooner mm -hmm. with the Conan, uh, but Conan really, I mean, he did a good job in Conan, but the film didn't do well, whatever. But I remember when he got this, you know, he came up to my house and he's like, he calls me Joji, like then, we're tough guys, Joji. I call him Moji. It's a little weird, I guess. Um, but I'm very he's like, he's like, um, Joji, man. I just got to say, I think I did. I think it's all good. <laughs> okay. And then they told me what it was. And they signed you on for, I think, seven picture deals. Now, like, that was quite a long time ago. It takes a while for it to all happen. But it's nice to see it finally culminate. Yeah. So it's all good. That's cool. Uh, question? Uh, hi. Yes. So you're talking about leasing uh, for the Stargate. Would that still be a possibility? Because Atlantis kind of got left in. Yes, it did. You know, I think that um, it could be getting close to the time to reapproach that. I think that there's probably one or two people aware that it's valuable inside that place. I mean, one of the frustrations I had is it's hard to explain all the dynamics, but basically, our show is doing really well. MGM was going bankrupt. It just this is the context with which most of this stuff happened. A group of guys from Texas bought an MGM for, I think, roughly $5 billion. And when they went to sell it, they literally couldn't even break the $2 billion. Nobody was even offering $2 billion. And so they were like, wow, we're going to take a bath. And they didn't know what to do, and they were panicked. And we were literally one of the only live productions they had. I think it might have been us, maybe James Bond. And Maybe another show, but we were probably the ones consistently paying the bills, the Stargate franchise. 
And um, they thought to themselves, I think in their mind, they were like, look, you don't, we're not increasing the value by having Stargate, because Stargate is an existing franchise. You only build the value of the studio by showing people that you can create new things, new cool edgy shows. And they didn't have the money to keep my show and a new Stargate on the other. So they did something that nobody ever does, which is they canceled one show and spun it off simultaneously, which is kind of like a suicide mission. But, um, so they really, I don't think they were thinking this thing through, but in their minds, they were like, if we do this, and if we reboot this, and we do a new show, the perception will be that we're actually a dynamic, functioning studio coming up with new material, and buyers will put that into play, and maybe it'll go to two and a half billion, or maybe even three million, who knows? And it obviously didn't work out that way. Um, and I tried to tell him, I said, look, what are you gonna do if Universe fails and you've now effectively destroyed the franchise? They're like, well, because I'm art, listen, when I get the phone call that my show's been canceled, I'm not just sitting there. <laughs> I get on the phone, what the fuck is going on? And it would be one thing if our ratings were bad and things like that, um, and we weren't making money. But I'm like, this doesn't make sense. And the way it was explained to me is what I explained to you. Uh, and basically, I said, if that thing goes down, you effectively, you know, kill the franchise. And they were like, yeah, that's, that's a possibility, but we don't think that'll be the case. And I said, well, if it is, just remember, you ain't gonna be able to revisit this franchise for a long time. So, so. <laughs> I love saying that. Everybody says you shouldn't say that, but you should. Don't care. Told so. Well, it's a fascinating time right now because, like, with Star Trek Discovery, and we've, uh, we've seen all these streaming platforms out there, and some are, like Discovery, doing well and actually uh, having traction. And TV, even though movies still have a big party, like, this is a great time for television. Um, so, everything old is kind of can be new again. Absolutely. It's the best time ever in television in a lot of ways. It is also getting to saturation yeah. level. I mean, I think, I don't know, do you guys ever feel like there's too, I mean, that's a bad way of putting it, but sometimes you feel like they're overwhelmed with choices. Yes. Yeah, it's a lot. Now, 10 years ago, or 15 years ago, you didn't have those choices. And it was a little easier. I mean, when Sopranos or Breaking Bad is coming out, you're like, wow, this is incredibly cool. And you still didn't have the choices. Now there's so many shows, and a lot of them are good. Mm -hmm. And they still aren't getting the traction. So I don't know at what point Hollywood pulls back and says, all right, we've delivered enough product. We can't keep pumping more product into the thing. Blah, blah, blah. It's business time. <laughs> Uh, actually, let me take one over here. Yes, far back, put your glasses. Yep, you, no, you're turning around, stand up. Uh, what's your favorite show as of recently? Oh, good question. What are you watching? Uh, it is the Trump show starring Donald Trump. <laughs> I can't stop watching it. It's like, uh, you know, it's like watching a car crash or something. <laughs> Uh, no, I think the best show I've seen recently was Barry. Oh, mm, yeah. Yeah, is Henry here? I, he's not here this weekend. Yeah, it's just great. It's just, to me, I love that. I love that dark comedy. Um, and Ozark is actually, and then there's this, I got addicted to this Italian TV show uh, called Gamora. It's all in subtitles, and it's about the mob and Naples. And it's really excellent. Um, it's like a slightly grittier Sopranos, but there's no sense of humor in this thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. Um, but I, for the first time, I really have always been too busy to watch TV. And um, I'd like to say I am now too, but um, literally I'm watching TV. <laughs> so I like to ask people, you know, and it's interesting how many shows are out there that are pretty good. I try to watch Godless. And Handmaid's Tale. You know? I know there's probably fans here. I, I don't know. I was watching it now and kind of lost my interest because I think what's happening sometimes is they take a great premise, they shoot it and try to stretch it into 13 episodes. 
So you're kind of watching it, and you realize you're like, actually, the plot never really moved forward in this episode. It's all textural, like an anime's tale. She comes out, and it's like rain. It's like rain. <laughs> she touches the rain, and rain touches her lips, and it's like rain. <laughs> And it's shot beautifully, and the actors are amazing, but I just feel like, I like shows that kind of just drive forward, so, anyway. Yeah, you can do a lot with like eight or ten episodes, and yet we're seeing sort of the, 13 is like the new 22 or 26 episode work. It is, and I, you know, there's certain tricks, so you, you, they sign up for 13, you're still, you're still asked to exclude yourself from the market for like the year. And you're not shooting as long, and you're shooting half the amount of episodes, roughly. So it's a it's a it's a bit of a dent you take in your income, but it doesn't matter if the show is good. Um, but I do think that sometimes one of the tricks is they go and they, a lot of times they, people think you shoot chronologically. No one always shoot chronologically. So sometimes they'll shoot a bunch. You can shoot three or four episodes in one week and pick up those elements later. And I just feel like sometimes they're shooting and they're like, how do we make an extra episode out of this? So, anyway. Right. <laughs> uh, Nightcrawler. Hi, Mr. Wow. Buddy. Hello. Hi, thanks for coming to Toronto. Thank um, you. Since, since you were just talking about it, what's, what was it like on Stargate Atlantis, your shooting schedule in terms of filming 22 episodes a year versus the television today, which is 10 to 13 episodes? What was that like for you as an actor? I mean, the first year it was tough. It was very tough. Uh, and then I, I flew, I finally brought my wife and kids up, and that was easier, because I was flying down all the time. And my wife, I think she made it through, well, less than a year. <laughs> it rains every day and then. Well, one day it rained like 38 straight days or something. And, I had a Canadian crew, and I was really one of the only Americans on the show for a while. And we'd love to have this like very fun little American versus Canada stuff. And um, so I get a phone call one day, and um, it's my wife in the parking lot of some grocery store, and she's got the dog, and they're locked out of the car, and it's raining, and the rain went through the grocery bags, and the food's on the ground. And she's just going, blah, 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 blah. and she's like, and, and, and fuck Canada. <laughs> <laughs> so I played it on speakerphone for my crew. <laughs> I, I didn't say it. She said it. <laughs> so I, I had to actually buy a house down in LA. And for four years, I commuted back and forth. And that was difficult. And when you're the lead of a show, and you're number one on the call sheet of a TV show, and you're doing 20, 22 episodes a year, it's a lot. You, if you go back and look at some of those, you'll see the people age. They just age fast. Um, and the truth is, I don't think I could have gotten through the last like three years to four years. But um, Jason and I actually lived together. I know you think like bad idea, right? <laughs> I had a hotel suite that the studio got me because I didn't even have time for an apartment. You know, and I needed, sometimes I get home at three in the morning, I have, from work, I have to get food from room service. So I had a two bedroom suite upstairs. It, it sounds really fancy, but trust me, it's not. Um, and Jason goes, hey man, I, I'm just gonna stay there for like, you know, a week, I gotta find an apartment. Two weeks goes by, three weeks, three years goes by. I knew I was in trouble after like the third week when all the buffalo skins moved in. <laughs> Corns on the wall. Yeah. Um, but we kind of kept each other sane because he also was flying back to LA every weekend. And so, uh, and, and you know, you need, you really need a mental break because the hours can be pretty tough. Um, but once you learn how to handle it, you learn how to handle it. So. I got good advice from Hugh Jackman, who's a good friend of mine, and he was up there shooting, I think, accident. And um, I said, I go, Hugh, you guys are so spoiled. First of all, you pay way too much money. <laughs> Secondly, you shoot like two pages a day. I shoot 12 pages a day. 
And he and and I, I don't have time to go work out and stuff. He goes, Yeah, you gotta do it. I go, Well, I would be waking up at 4 30 in the morning working out. He goes, You gotta do it. I said, You're crazy, I can't do that. So I did it actually, and it, it was helpful. Of course by like eight o'clock at night I'm like <laughs> But that's the type of discipline required to actually get through it without flagging. And you can really flag on your shows. Yeah. yeah. Would you go back and do, well, I mean, now, aside from a couple shows, there's not too many 22 episode shows. I would love to be like number three or four on a call. Yeah. Because <laughs> sometimes, you know, Tori, who was on the show the first two years, and she was always complaining that she didn't have enough work. Where else? Awesome. You work one day a week and then you mess around and go play on in Vancouver and you're getting paid the same amount as everybody else. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not like we don't love acting and it's beautiful, but remember, it's work too. You're, you're on set. It's not like you're like, I'm tired, have somebody substitute for me today. Um, although that's a great idea. <laughs> and so it does get tiring. Um, and, uh, you know, being number three or four on a call sheet is, can be really, yeah. really ideal on some levels. But nothing beats being number one on the call sheet because if you have an ego like I do, <laughs> you like to look at the call sheet and say, excuse me, uh, who's number one? Oh, I'm number one. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. It's really humble. <laughs> and also you drive in a ship and it helps you drive. The truth is we're really an ensemble cast. But there's still a lead, and the lead, they made an edict in the studio that said, we need Joe in more scenes. And even if he doesn't have dialogue, put him in the scenes. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> so there was all these scenes at the end, and I'm not even speaking. And I'm like, what dumb shit is the studio? It's like, I don't know what to do today. Let's put Joe in every scene. <laughs> And he's having lunch at the Ivy and having a good time, and I'm in every scene. <laughs> and um, it can get tricky, but there, there are tricks to this. Mm -hmm. So if you stand next to the person who has dialogue and getting covered first, say it's Rachel, I would stand right next to her. <laughs> and then she gets shot up, she's done. And that means I'm done. Because <laughs> then they turn around to everybody else. And well, we don't need you, you have no dialogue, so... Um, and Chris Judge really is the master of this. Chris Judge learned this long ago. Yeah, his big fat head would be like that. And Jason too. Uh, let's go deep back there, in the very back row. Yes, yeah. Are you crazy? <laughs> I just told you how difficult that was. You think I'm gonna like hang out in the studio? That was like, get me out of here. <laughs> no, I mean, no. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's no other answer than no. Uh, I mean, I understand your question, but the people we would hang out with. First of all, I didn't have a hangout time. I, I didn't have a hangout. Literally, I have like 10 hours with me the time I leave set, get to the hotel, take a shower, bring the lines the next day, fall asleep, wake up, get back to the set. So there's no kind of hangout time. And um, when I did have hangout time, it would be, you know, maybe the stunt guys. But I, in four years or something, I never spent one weekend in Vancouver, I would be back to LA, because I had three kids and they had games and stuff, so I'd have to go back to work. Um, so there wasn't a lot of hangout time, but the, everybody on the show, I still see a lot of them, and even the stunt guys, they pass through LA, they'll stay with me and stuff. And so, you, you do become like a family. Um, a dysfunctional one, perhaps. <laughs> like every family. Um, but yeah, you learn a lot, and you learn a lot about people, and you've got about, I think they, I, I, I could be mistaken, but I, I, I know I was well north of 10,000 hours. I think it was close to 13,000 hours logged just on the set alone. And that's not at the hotels and the airports. And when you're spending 13,000 hours with people, that's a chunk of your life. Um, 
and so you really do get to know people. And it's important to kind of be still and be there. Because a lot of times you want to say to yourself, I need to be someplace else. Yeah. This is boring, this is meticulous, I can shoot this really fast, I just want to get home, my kids got a soccer game. And you go through that process. And, you know, I had, uh, my father died while I was shooting once. And I remember getting that phone call and I said to myself, you know, what I'd like to do is go back and shoot because I can't get home today. Um, and the thing that makes me the most comfortable is just going through the process of what I do every day and being with people that I know really well. You know, I know these people well. And so, yeah, it's, it's an interesting experience for sure. Yeah. And I guess like, you know, most people probably don't hang out with their coworkers, you know, after a long day of work, the last thing you want to do is like, hang out with them too much after a 14 hour shift, you know? Take one over, uh, hi, right up front. Hi. hi. Um, you said it's like a family, and like every family goes a joker. Yes. Who's and most joker? murders happen with your family. <laughs> <laughs> Who was the joker of the family? It was certainly, well, it, 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 pranksters and jokesters, uh, okay, the person who has really the most savage wit is David, without <laughs> hands on. I mean, he's just, he gets on a roll, and he's just like, blah, 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 blah. never heard somebody complain so much, <laughs> and it's hilarious. He is like a hyperactive Lee Allen kind of something, he's just something else. And um, as far as pranksterism, I think Jason and I probably unfortunately took that mantle. Um, we were always goofing off and, you know, having fun and pulling jokes on people. Um, but, yeah, I would say that being a, being a, a jokester and being a prankster, a little different. But it was a real joy to work with all of them. And then we could not have done this without Rachel, because Rachel is perhaps the greatest straight man of all time. <laughs> if anybody knows what a straight man is in comedy, is somebody who sits there and pretends like they don't understand things. Because I don't think she did half the time. <laughs> and it was hilarious. She just put up with a level of bullshit that I don't think anybody could have done. <laughs> and I, I'm very grateful to her for doing that. <laughs> and so we just jive a lot as a cast. Thank you. Let's take one up here, uh, right up front. Hi. Um, my question is, once you finish your role on Stargate, um, who do you keep in touch with the most, or have you lost connections with some of the cast that you wish you hadn't? I mean, Jason is the guy I'm with the most. Um, you know, I'm cl very close with him and his kids, and he's close to my kids, and we live near each other. Um, I I kind of miss David. I haven't seen David in a while. Uh, I called up, ironically, Brad, uh, our producer, Brad Wright. He's doing a show called Travelers. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and so I just let them know that I thought the show was great and um, it looks good. And, you know, you miss, you miss people. Um, but, you know, there's nobody there that I think, God, thank God I'm not with them anymore. <laughs> I'm myself sometimes. You know? um, so, yeah. But you, you mentioned, or we've talked about sort of, it's a great time for TV right now. Well, there's a lot of sci-fi genre out there on TV and on the big screen. Is that heartening for you, or do you fear that there will be like a sci-fi saturation as well? No, I don't think, in fact, anything, I think there's a dearth of science fiction shows. There are at least, look, anything that uses special effects, is that sci-fi? I don't know. But in terms of kind of classic sci-fi stuff that is derivative from, say, Star Trek, Battlestar, and things like that. No, I don't think there's, there's really very few shows. Mm -hmm. I think that's the market that could be hit. I think that if they make space-driven sci-fi shows, I think there's a huge market for it. They just haven't done it or done it well. Except, I tried to watch, um, what's his name? 
Who's the, uh, why am I forgetting his name? The, the guy who created uh, Family Guy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. I watched it and I was like, is this serious or not serious? <laughs> Is that it's okay. So it's, it's more sophisticated than I thought it was. Because I was like, wow, it looks really bad. Because <laughs> they're all just sitting there, like wooden, with a green screen. And I'm like, it looks really bad. But I think it's meant to kind of, so it's meant to pay homage to that kind of sticky sci-fi thing. Yeah. Um, well, in that case, I'll watch it. But, um, <laughs> I mean, because he's so clever. Uh, Watching him being serious is just, it's kind of weird. You know, I think it's weird. Um, so I'll give that a shot. But um, yeah. other than that, I don't know what's out there in terms of space driven drums. Things like The Expanse and, you know, like, I think that there's quote unquote hard sci fi out there, but a lot of it is not necessarily following that pattern. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, let's take one from over here on this side. Hi, yeah. Uh, me? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to know, as your sons are getting older, are, have, they, have the older ones seen Stardew Valley? Um, you know, no, they didn't watch it. But you know, it's interesting. Um, so they watched it, they would watch it a little bit, and they would get really scared. But like, is daddy gonna die? <laughs> it was really kind of sweet. And now they're like, God, I hope that dies. <laughs> That's cool. Oh, he gets shot. That's cool. Replay that one. <laughs> um, so they never really watch. I never encourage them to watch the things I've done. Um, mostly because there's no need to. Um, I have one son who's just approached the acting thing, which is interesting because he really wanted to do it. And I kind of said, no, you're not doing it. <laughs> Look how I can. <laughs> But you can't keep somebody from trying to do the things they want to do. So I think for a year he kept saying, I really want to do it, I really want to do it. And I said, no. I think like two years went by and he's like, Dad, you're lame. You don't do what you say you're going to do. I was like, all right. So I drove him out of the agency. And they said, oh, okay, it's interesting. You know, we have an audition, you know, a couple, like three or four blocks down the road. You want to go to it now? Okay. We went down there and he books it. It was like a Verizon commercial, but whatever. And, I, and then we're driving. I don't know. We found out like a couple of days later, and he's like, "God, this is really easy." <laughs> so, like, oh, shit. so who knows? <laughs> and we have time for just uh, probably two more questions. Uh, I'll get to you, Wonder Woman. I'm going to go right up front here. Uh, we'll Serve with the beard. Hi. Uh, have you seen uh, Stargate Origins? What do you think about it? I didn't really see it. I saw the clips of it. And Connor's a great actor. Um, and I just think the quality of it is not very good. Like the production, like the production quality. To me, production quality is important. I mean, unless you're doing Orville and it's supposed to be on purpose or something. <laughs> um, you know, in all fairness, I think if you don't get good backing and put the money into production, you have a hard time reaching that mainstream audience that you need to reach. You need quality. And one challenge that a lot of Canadians have is they don't have the money to put into the TV shows that we do. And so you'll get, you get American shows that are made in Canada, and they do really well. But a lot of Canadian-made shows in Canada don't make it over the hump because, strictly because of the production value. It's not the acting, it's not the writing, it's not anything, it's the production value, and you can see it. And so, I think that in particular, that Origins was done through some Canadian thing, and it was done on a shoestring budget. And I think you can see it. So, I don't think it drives, I don't think it pushes the ball forward to be honest with you. Um, but I hope it works out. So, I mean, it's a good idea to do a prequel, I think, you know? Yeah, let's take one over here. Uh, yes, with the, let me go deeper back with the green top. Yes, and the glasses, right there, yep. What was your favorite experience doing Stargate 
Wow. Uh, God, there's so many things. I mean, one is, I mean, look, I basically was getting paid money to act like a little boy. You know, I mean, I was. I was running around with guns, shooting things, and you know, acting like a brat. I was like, this is awesome. Uh, and so, when it came to the actual shooting, I think it was the, the character itself was an awful lot of fun to play. Uh, there's always something new and interesting I could do, and the guns were, I mean, I hate to say it, I don't want to send a shout out. Um, I know you guys in Canada don't like guns. I love guns. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't have a bunch of guns at home, trust me. But I love shooting the guns on the show, I and mean, it was just incredible. It was a lot of fun. And um, also doing a show with an interesting combination of drama and comedy. Um, that comedy, that we had, that self-deprecation we had in the show is really fun and it really helps a lot because sometimes you go to a really serious show and if the writing isn't really, really good, it's just really, really bad and it looks ridiculous. And so I think we understood that we we're on an adventure and our lives are in danger sometimes and it's also a lot of fun, you know, and so I miss that balance. But the truth is, to me, it always comes down to just basic human relationships. I spent a chunk of my life on that show. I really love those people. They're like family. So I miss that the most. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Wonder Woman, I said I'd come back to you, so I'm going to finish with you. Hi, what's your question? Favorite seasons? Uh, season six. <laughs> That was when all my pay raises were supposed to happen. I, I could have predicted that. I, I should have known that we're going to season six because I kept going, if we go to season six, I could buy a new house. Um, no, I, I think, I don't really look at it in terms of seasons. I will say that I think the production quality and the special effects and everything got better and better and better. So toward the end, we're, we had some real movie quality kind of special effects. And if you look at the beginning of the show, we made huge leaps. We were also one of the first shows to really be green screen centered. Uh, there weren't a lot of shows that were like totally green screen like we were. So we were one of the early ones doing it and on HD. Um, and so we had to learn in the process and the show got better and better and better. Also, as the show goes on and the characters get more um, Involved, the writers have an easier time writing for those characters, uh, and so they you feed off each other. They look at your performance, and then they can write for your performance, and then it just feeds off each other. Um, but I don't know season wise which one's best. I could tell you that my favorite episode, just because of the potential, and also because it was the most out of the box episode, was Vegas. I was like, oh, okay we should have done this in the second or third season because it opens up a whole new storytelling platform and we need it, you know, we need a new dimension to deal with. Uh, so that was a lot of untapped potential. So anyways, I don't really look at it in terms of the seasons. And, and I know you guys do because you watch the show. And to me, I'm behind the curtain, so I just see I'm in the sausage factory, let's just say, let's put it that way. I'm watching the sausage being made. And so it's really my coworkers and stuff like that that I look at the most. So. Okay. Well, uh, Fan Expo Canada, like, we've reached the end of this panel, but you're going to be here all weekend, right? I am. So uh, you guys should go check him out, go, uh, visit him at his booth, and uh, say hi. Thank, Thank you. you guys so much. For watching the Convention Junkies coverage of Fan Expo Canada 2018. Join the conversation below with a comment, and don't forget to like and subscribe to see more. If you would like to help us with future projects, please visit our Patreon page.